Welcome to Zcast, everyone. I'm Zias Caraval from ZK Research, and I'm here in person at Mobile World Congress 2024 in Barcelona. I'm here, uh, I'm not really at the HP stand. We're outside in their little hospitality area. It's quite nice outside. This is, I think, I never come to here and get to go outside, so thanks for that, guys. <laughs> uh, anyways, I'm joined today by Phil Mottram. You're the SVP and GM of HPE's Intelligent Edge. Just a quick bio on yourself, Phil. Uh, yeah, my background is um, all in telecoms, actually. So I used to work for some of the big carriers, so uh, BT, Vodafone, and Telstra. And then I've been with Hewlett Packard Enterprise for about the last five years and running the Aruba business for the last two and a half years. Yeah, that's uh, one of the best performing group inside HP, I think. So Indeed, and long, long may it remain like that. <laughs> we have uh, David Hughes, the uh, Chief Product Officer. Uh, for H, uh, for the Aruba division of or in HPE Intelligent Edge, I guess correctly, right? So a little bio on yourself as well. Sure. So I joined Aruba three years ago as uh, part of the Silver Peak acquisition. I started Silver Peak in 2004, and I was CTO for the yeah. first half of that, and then CEO in the second. Prior to that, I worked uh, um, at various places, including Cisco and Nortel. So. My life's been in networking as well. And what I remember about Silver Peak is uh, the hard pivot they made from uh, WAN optimization to SD-WAN, faster than really any of the other um, uh, WAN op companies. And I think uh, because of that, you got a pretty good early mover advantage in it. So Yeah, yeah. No, that, was, that was really one of the um, key decisions yeah. that, that I made to make that big bet. Uh, now, as I said, we are here at MWC. and. Uh, um, Big themes here, AI, 5G. Uh, what's caught your eye? Have you seen anything here that's been interesting to you? Um, I think, obviously, AI is everywhere. Yeah. And, I think know, every stand says AI on it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, you know, I think, I think that, the, that there's a lot of hype around generative AI, and it maybe detracts from a lot of the good things that have been happening in AI more general, and kind of a steady progress. Um, so, you know, I'm very optimistic and excited about uh, what we are doing with AI ourselves. Um, and um, I think that there's part of this which is hype, but there's a lot that's happening um, kind of slow and steady behind the scenes that's so going to be really transformative. Yeah, and how about you, Phil? What have you seen here that, uh, I, I mean, know look, it's only day one, but. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, look, I think, um, the show is definitely back, isn't it? Yes. I mean, it is super busy. Uh, 95,000, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I think a couple of years ago after COVID, people were sort of wondering, is it going to come back as a show? Yeah. And it is definitely back as a show, I isn't it? I have a question whether we actually need the show. Yeah yeah, 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 no, so I think, you know, one of the things that's dawned on me is, yeah, it's super busy here, so everyone seems to be back, and yeah, I get the fact there's a lot of conversations about AI, but I also think that the telco industry generally is under a lot of pressure, you know, uh, the operators around the world have made a lot of CapEx investments in rolling out 5G networks and other investments that they've made, and they're now looking for a way to get a return on the investment, so I think that's the other theme that I have in the meetings uh, with the customers so far. So where, and I want to stay on the 5, 5G theme a little bit here, where are we in, in the global deployments? Because it seems 5G has been hyped for as long as I can rem as long as we've had 4G, right? <laughs> and uh, it still seems the 5G footprint isn't all that big. There's, uh, there's a lot of chatter between private 5G, public 5G, and I think it confuses customers. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think that's a good observation, actually. Yeah. I would imagine, for the most part, the 5G rollouts the bulk of them have happened. And then, to your point, I think the telecoms operators have been looking for, you know, how do we get a return back on the investments that we've been making? And in some instances, private 5G is a way to do that. One of the things that we've done as a company, uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, is we acquired a company called Athernet yep. last year. And what they specialize in is um, private 5G technology. And what we find is that that technology is very useful for customers where either speed or outdoor coverage is important. So with private 5G as a technology, as I say, you can cope with um, kind of robots in warehouses, yeah. whizzing up and down aisles really quickly, or get great coverage in outdoor spaces. So we think that's um, a good opportunity for some of the telecoms carriers to take that technology to their customers. Yeah, and David, um, since you're running product, uh, I'm curious as to, so one of the debates that comes up all the time is 5G versus Wi-Fi, 
right? And uh, as, as you mentioned, Phil, um, there's some good use cases for uh, 5G, uh, but have you heard customers wanting to replace Wi-Fi with it or long-term, or is this I think still a complicated Yeah, I, we, we strongly believe it's going to be a hybrid world. So not just hybrid 5G and Wi-Fi, but if you think about IoT, there's also Bluetooth and Zigbee, yeah. a whole lot of different radio protocols. We forget that are, about those. Yeah, yeah, that are each optimized for different price points in terms of what it costs in the sensor and different distances and so on. So 5G is um, good for getting broad coverage. It's good for dealing with um, fast-moving targets like vehicles. Um, and it is actually a pretty good complement to Wi-Fi in that sense for, for outdoor applications, for big warehouses, ports, um, mines, and so on. And I think really the thing that's been holding up adoption a lot is that it's just a whole different technology for the enterprise IT manager and um, what we need to do is make it make 5G as easy to deploy as Wi-Fi yeah. and make it work well make the two work well together so that this um, ability to complement each other becomes sort of four. Well and that is the challenge and I was, that was why I was glad when uh, HP acquired Ethan, Ethernet because uh, uh, it, without that and an enterprise company actually deploying it uh, a lot of the Early, early adopter companies had to go with the carrier yeah. companies, right? And yeah. that technology is not really meant for uh, for enterprises. And so it's been about a year since you made the acquisition. Uh, can you shed some light as to how that how it's how it's gone? Yeah, I mean we're really really pleased with that acquisition. Um, lots of interest from customers and lots of new use cases. So, um, I mean, David just mentioned their warehouses, ports. We see a lot of interest as well from um, military customers. Oh. Um, so I think they like the security aspects of deploying 5G or private 5G on military bases. Um, also the Athernet solution, they actually have a private 5G network in a backpack that a soldier could take onto a battlefield. That's pretty cool. So actually, yeah. yeah. And, and if you think about in disaster situations as well, let's say you had an earthquake, Often in an earthquake situation, the mobile network gets wiped out. So if you can send someone into an earthquake zone with a mobile network essentially in a backpack, that's a great way as well to find people who might be trapped under you know, a, an earthquake or a, a sort of um, a building. So yeah, we see lots of um, good applications of the technology. So I've seen, uh, you know, some of the use cases you came up with warehousing, uh, manufacturing, those have been uh, uh, widely known use cases for private cellular, and it's yeah. where we've seen it before. Yeah. Are you seeing uh, use cases in more general enterprise uh, interest there? Yeah, I think most enterprise customers, you know, if you think about big organizations, typically they would have a range of buildings, wouldn't they? So they'd have some office yeah. spaces, you know, they might have some retail outlets, but then also they might have some warehouses or some outdoor facilities. So, you know, what we see is, you know, we're trying to attract large enterprise customers and say, you know what, doesn't matter your situation, we have a range of technologies to help you, yeah. and private 5G, private 5G is one of them, but it's in parallel with Wi-Fi and other technologies. Yeah. And what might, you know, the, for the, the general enterprise CIO, um, uh, in one of the workshops I was doing, I asked them all, who's got interest in private 5G? They, every one of them put up their hands, mm. right? Then I said, who's got a good use case? All of them put down their hands. Is that right? Yeah, and well, I think, Everyone understands the robotics application and autonomous businesses, and that's why I was asking you about you know, use cases. If I'm a uh, the CIO of a bank or something, where might I look to use private 5G? Yeah, look, so I think for some industries like banking, yeah. there's probably less opportunity, albeit within private 5G, we're looking as to whether or not we should add neutral host as a capability, which would essentially replicate or replace uh, DAS systems, wouldn't yes. it, for, for improving... I, I think that's the use case, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think when you move outside of banking to manufacturing, industrial, you know, military, public sector, hospitals, in those sorts of situations, I think there's a lot of use cases. And then uh, you had talked about uh, the relationship you have with this, trying to get service providers to play this, this more. Uh, how has this changed your relationship uh, with them? Look, I think they, as we talked about earlier, I think a lot of the service providers are under pressure and they need to show a return on the investments that they've made in these big networks, such as 
They always struggle to do that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And so I think, you know, private 5G complements what they've already done in public 5G. So I think it's a good opportunity for them to be able to provide more of an end-to-end solution for their customers. Yeah. And now, uh, let me go back to you, David. From a product perspective, um, I ran a survey last year asking about 4G, 5G uh, adoption as well as Wi-Fi. And it was pretty clear everybody wanted both. But they said where they really struggle is on the management of the two. Because if I have two separate systems, there's two sets of policies, two separate sets of sec- you know, security uh, you know, configurations. And so what do you, what's HP thinking about from a, from a management perspective where they might be able to simplify that? Yeah, so from our uh, kind of uh, long-term vision, we want to bring that all under Aruba Central. So make it as easy to manage these 5G deployments as it is to manage Wi-Fi. Just like you would buy Wi-Fi access points today, you can buy, uh, you want to be able to buy um, small cell radios, deploy them in the same way, manage them in the same way. I think, I really think the fact that everything's different and for an enterprise more complicated yeah. is a lot of what's holding back these um, applications. So unified um, management, is, we think, is going to be key to getting broader adoption. Uh, you know, because that uh, there's different different use cases have different returns, right? And um, it, it, at some of the things like these wind farms and mines, it's like a total no-brainer. Then as you come down the stack and you're looking at, say, a university campus or a hospital campus, having um, broad um, neutral host-based 5G coverage to complement Wi-Fi makes a lot of sense, but it needs to be easily managed. They need to be able to do it with their current IT resources. You can't do that if you have to train a whole whole new team to go manage this other network. That won't make sense. Well, in fact, uh, I think you have history on your side too. Like Wi-Fi really didn't become ubiquitous uh, de- ubiquitously deployed until you can manage it through the same systems you can manage your wired infrastructure from. Yeah. Right? And so similarly, I don't really know why this wouldn't play out that way. So, yeah. Now, one of the more interesting use cases I saw was at the Ryder Cup, which HP was a sponsor of. And so can you talk about that deployment? I, I, I really thought that was a unique Yeah, one. so we've got a great partnership yeah. with uh, the Ryder Cup um, in deploying network technology for um, their sporting events. It's quite an interesting event. I mean, a lot of people attend the Ryder Cup. I think they had like 200 200, 250,000 so. people yeah. show up uh, in Rome recently for the uh, for the tournament, which the Europeans won, of I, course. Yeah. <laughs> in, in, a, in, a, in a pretty big uh, yeah. margin. And, big uh, anyway, but yeah, it's, um, you know, so we, we work with their uh, technology office, and what they wanted to do um, this year was deploy both Wi-Fi and private 5G across the course. Uh, and the way they were using the uh, technology was they were actually using the private 5G network to do backhaul from the uh, kind of Wi-Fi hotspots um, around the course. And it is quite an interesting use case um, because I think in Rome there's obviously quite a lot of um, restrictions with regard to digs yeah. given the uh, the history. So, you know, so it's digging up a golf course and laying fiber is not happening. Right? Correct. Yeah. Exactly <laughs> right. So, you know, I think that's uh, that's a, an interesting use case that uh, we saw with the Radica. Yeah, in fact, I think the, they claim that this was the most eco-friendly and most sustainable Ryder Cup ever, and the, the network played a big role in that. Yeah, exactly right. And there's actually quite a lot of complexity in the network that they build, because not only do they have to have a network that works for the 200,000 fans or whatever it is, but also they need a network for the security of the uh, event, yeah. the players, you know, the TV broadcast stations, et cetera, et cetera. So it's actually pretty They were telling me network. one of the big challenges was when you think about deploying, and I know HP is in a lot of stadiums, right? Yeah. He says, if you think about a stadium deployment, you're, everybody's there, for three hours or whatever, right? Yeah. But at a golf course, the entire stadium moves, yeah. right? At, you know, as you move, uh, as the players move along. And so that's not something that you really have to deal with in any other industry. And actually you have to have a very, very uh, high level of performance yeah. for a concentrated three or four yeah. days of one of the event is, isn't it? Because yeah. he was, the CTO was explaining to me that, you know, if you hit like 99.5% performance over a three-day period, that's still something like a 25-minute downtime. Yeah. And you can imagine the amount of TV viewers watching that sporting event, and if it went off the network for 25 minutes, I mean, that would be a disaster, wouldn't that, it? That so, would be a disaster, yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, well, just um, one last question, and, uh, yeah. uh, and I, it's hard to... You know, talk, think about HPE without without talking Juniper, yeah. and uh, and I know you're in a quiet period, so I can't ask you too much. I'm just uh, curious as to how you're thinking that might change your service provider relationships. 
Well, look, yeah, I mean, we, we believe that the acquisition is a great opportunity for us to scale up our networking presence even further. Yeah. So it was going to kind of pivot uh, HP as a company to having networking being the core part of the organization and the business uh, that we operate in. And this um, acquisition, as I say, gives us more scale in the network space, gives us great capabilities in AI and other parts of uh, the technology areas that we need. And this will make a big difference, I think, to the service provider relationships that we have. Because HPE has got multi-billion dollar relationships with service providers yeah. anyway, through our compute products, our RIBA relationships, some of the software as well that we provide to carriers like orchestration. But then also on the Juniper side, they've got a really big service provider organization. So we're looking forward to bringing all those teams together when the transaction closes, hopefully at the end of the year. Yeah. And actually, I lied. One, one more. I'm going to go back to David here. Yeah. Since you mentioned AI, uh, where are we in AI for networking? Uh, and where do you, th you know, right now, if I'm a network engineer, how should I be thinking about where to use it? Because there's a lot of theoretical use cases. And as an, if I was a network engineer, I can't do all of them. What would be my starting point? Yeah, so uh, the way that we look at it is a way to kind of accelerate deployment and accelerate troubleshooting. So, so we, be zero day. Yeah. yeah, and so I think the um, where AI is excelling today is really in that day two, um, helping identify anomalies and then helping oh. troubleshoot. So in Aruba Central, we have uh, almost 100 AI insights now where the AI is running autonomously and identifying um, either problems or opportunities to improve performance or improve coverage and recommending those changes to the operator who can then say yes and as well as saying yes they can also check a box that says if you see something like this in future do it automatically so we're kind of giving our customers some of them are some of them are more comfortable with having human mediated AI they want to be in the loop on every um, decision others are more aggressive and kind of want to offload their people from having to deal with yeah. these things so it's um, it's it's happening today and it actually doesn't take uh, a lot of AI expertise on behalf of the customer we've got a, a big well, you team. do all the heavy lifting for them. Yeah, yeah, we've got a big team of data scientists that are doing that to kind of wrap it in a way that any customer can adopt. Yeah, one of the interesting data points in my research, and this is why I think Wi-Fi is the best place to start with AI, is uh, wireless engineers spend about a quarter of their time doing nothing but Wi-Fi troubleshooting. Is that right? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. A, it's a huge number. So uh, I don't know where you were when I was an engineer, <laughs> but, I wish you, but I wish you had had that capability then. So, so I spent a lot yeah. of time trying to figure out problems with Wi-Fi. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, uh, thanks for the update, guys. Yeah, All right. Thanks. thanks. Yeah, so, so it's always good to catch up with you guys and yeah. hear what's going on in, in AI and 5G. And really, those two technologies in a lot of ways are coming together, too. Yeah. So, yeah. That's totally right. So Definitely. on behalf of David Hughes and Phil Montrum, I'm Zias Caravalla from CK Research saying thanks for watching. As always, make sure you hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you next time on my next episode of Zcast.